Welcome to part 3 of the switching tutorial series. In this video we'll be discussing the basics of VLANs. So to understand what VLANs are, uh, we'll compare them to what we've been talking about so far, which is traditional LANs. And what you'll find is that VLANs are just sort of an evolution of a more efficient way to use switching equipment. So in a LAN, uh, as you'll recall, Let's say we drop a simple LAN here, um, and we have a couple of users. These users are always going to be part of the same broadcast domain. So there's always only going to be one LAN involved here. And if we wanted a separate broadcast domain, we'd have to have a separate set of switches that create their own LAN, and so on. But the advantage with VLANs is that on the same physical hardware, we're actually able to divide up different ports on the switches to be parts of different LANs. So let me illustrate an example of that here. So let's say we have switches with two different VLANs here. And we'll say the green is VLAN 20 and the purple will be VLAN 10. Now let's say a user on VLAN 10 wants to send a broadcast packet. When it goes out, instead of going out to every single port like it would on a traditional LAN, it will instead only go out to members of the same VLAN. So for example, the, the members on VLAN 20 here are not going to receive this broadcast packet, and vice versa. And so what, you, what you'll notice is that what we've achieved is a logical separation on the same physical hardware. So again, if you refer to this previous example, where we would previously need two completely separate uh, sets of hardware, here we only need one and we're still able to subdivide it accordingly. So the way that VLANs accomplish this is through what they call tags or tagging and tags are basically just a number that's inserted into the packet uh, that represent what VLAN uh, the packet is a part of so the switch knows how to process it accordingly and there are two kinds of ports that we that are relevant to this process drop a little network here so the first are what we would call access ports and these are usually what you configure for end users and such and what happens is on the switch for an access port it will ignore any existing VLAN so if this user tries to tag their VLAN packet it will just disregard that and it only will pay attention to what you configure on the port so if we say this port is part of VLAN 10 when the user sends their packet in, and usually these packets are untagged, but again, if they are tagged, it'll just ignore them and rewrite it. It'll come into the switch, and then once the switch takes the packet in, it will tag the packet as VLAN 10. Now the second kind of port we deal with for VLANs is what's called a trunk port. And most often, uh, this is for links between two switches, but sometimes there are special cases where it might be used for other purposes. Now a trunk port works a bit differently because A, it won't tag packets by default. It will just accept whatever packets are pre-tagged. And the idea being is that multiple VLANs will flow across the, the same trunk, right? So if we have VLAN 10 and we've got a user over here that's also part of uh, VLAN 10, and again maybe we have VLAN 20, it'll allow packets from all the different VLANs to flow back and forth. Now, it is also possible to configure which VLANs are allowed. So we could say uh, VLAN 10 is allowed, but maybe uh, for security reasons or other reasons we don't want to allow VLAN 20, and it would then not allow those packets to cross. But generally, uh, these are wide open by default and will allow all different VLANs to pass. Now, <clears throat> Trunk ports usually aren't used to tag packets, but in the event that it does see an untagged packet come across the trunk, 
there's what we would call the native VLAN that can be configured and it will just assume that any untagged traffic on this trunk is part of the native VLAN. Now there are a few other things we have to consider when dealing with VLANs and the first uh, relates to concerns with trunking. So let's say we've got a, a network of four switches here. And let's say on this particular VLAN uh, it's been configured so that we've got three different users that are on VLAN 10 across the four switches. Now let's say that the network administrators configured this trunk to permit VLAN 10 and this trunk to permit VLAN 10, but this trunk will not allow VLAN 10, nor will this one. So what we've done is we've created a scenario here where if this user tries to send traffic to this user, they'll have a clear path to get there. But because there's no path to the VLAN 10 here, we would say that we've orphaned this port and traffic is unable to reach it. So it's almost like they're now on completely separate lands and they're not able to talk to each other. And so you want to be careful whenever you set up a new VLAN, always make sure that your trunks will permit the traffic uh, from end to end wherever the VLAN needs to reach to. Now you may be thinking, if that's the case, why shouldn't I just have all of my trunks trunk all of my VLANs? Well, let's take a look. Let's say uh, we have a slightly more complex network here. So we've got these three switches and we'll say their main job is to host VLAN 20. And we've got these three switches and their main job is to host VLAN 30. And then on top of that because we didn't want to have to worry about it, uh, when we set up VLAN 10, we made it so that it goes across all these switches and then over to here and around all these switches. So VLAN 10 spans all of these. Now you'll probably recognize this setup from the last video where we discussed switching loops and that's pretty relevant to what we're talking about here. So let's say there's a, a situation where VLAN 20 has a switching loop, right? So it's going to cause all three of these switches to not be able to pass traffic. Well, despite that, uh, VLAN 30 will remain relatively untouched. And so by keeping these VLANs small, we've shrank the impact of a failure scenario. However, let's say the same thing happens to VLAN 10 where Maybe you get a switching loop over here, over here, or you know, anywhere in that VLAN, it's going to cause all of these switches to become unavailable. And so that's a, that's a pretty catastrophic failure. So just something to keep in mind, where possible, try to keep VLAN as small as possible. And one other thing that's worth mentioning while we're looking at these is that spanning tree runs on a per VLAN basis. And so VLAN 20 will have its own instance of spanning tree. VLAN 30 will have its own instance of spanning tree, and VLAN 10 will as well. And so all three of them are going to run their own instance, and we call that per VLAN spanning tree, or PVST. That concludes part three, so let's briefly go over the concept we discussed around VLANs. So first, uh, you'll recall that VLANs use tags to identify traffic bound for different VLANs. Second, we use access ports to tag traffic from end users. And we also ignore other tags on the port. Three, we use trunk ports to connect different switches together and allow multiple VLANs worth of traffic across the same port. And also, we want to remember that all participating switches need to have the VLANs trunk to them accordingly.
forth, uh, kind of weighing against this uh, all participating switches, we do also want to try to limit uh, VLAN size or the amount of trunk ports that are allowing the VLAN to propagate uh, to try to minimize failure scenarios such as broadcast storms on a VLAN. And lastly, uh, it's also important to remember that uh, spanning tree runs on a per VLAN basis, which we call again uh, PVST or per VLAN spanning tree. Thank you for watching.